So um, in light of reflecting on homilies, um, I think one of the things that I've been gifted with is the opportunity to receive Monsignor's teaching. Um, and a couple of things that I want to reflect on from the first uh, talk, going into our second talk, one of them is how we talked about living in a life of tension and disappointment and anger growing up. I really appreciate his vulnerability there. I can definitely relate that as a cradle Catholic growing up in, in a home where my parents were so devoted. Um, and yet some of our biggest fights happened on the way to church. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. Um, but they were so fervent. Uh, my father was a Louisiana Catholic, uh, for those of you who know those kind of Catholics. And my mother was a Latin. She was from Puerto Rico. And um, I never knew growing up that uh, there were addiction and mental health issues in our family. Um, I learned in my own program and in my own work that both my grandfathers were alcoholics. And when I think about that, um, that tension, that disappointment, that anger, uh, especially at this age now with my wife and four children, I have so much more grace uh, and mercy. Um, my mother passed away five years ago from cardiac arrest. Um, so a very sudden passing, uh, kind of our compass for our family. Our father uh, died this past year. Um, and so without them here to listen to Monsignor um, talk with this message is just so powerful today. And I can tell some of you are resonating with it as well. The other thing uh, that really, that I've been learning from him lately is uh, about St. Bonaventure. And um, I'm so fascinated by him. There's the guy over there, he's over there. Um, I'm so fascinated by how Monsignor talks about uh, St. Bonaventure, especially in light of, of St. Thomas Aquinas, and what I'm learning from the teaching about how here in the West, uh, St. Thomas's uh, message of the intellectuality of our faith is what kind of took precedent, whereas in the East, it was more Franciscan. It was more Bonaventure's uh, experiential way of following Christ was, was very... Um, impactful and almost led, right? And so I love the, the, um, the opportunity to learn about some of the fathers of the church that I haven't known as much. I know at the University of Dallas, we had a lot of Thomas Aquinas. Um, and I love reading about him. Um, one of my favorites was St. Augustine. But to have St. Bonaventure, I feel like I'm getting uh, educated all over again. So uh, those are just two quick reflections. Um, thank you so much for being here. When Monsignor does finish here at the end, uh, I will kind of close and hopefully put a bow on, on the day. So thank you so much for being here again. Welcome, Monsignor Don Fisher back. Okay. Where, uh, where were we? Um, open those four open ones. <clears throat> One of the things that um, I don't think Will mentioned, but maybe he was told not to, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, along with everything else that I'm trying, <clears throat> I'm doing now, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm also, um, do you remember when I said I was going to write a book? Does anybody remember that? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> It's <laughs> my fr my friends gave me such grief. Uh, is it finished? Is it finished yet? Is it finished yet? And I just oh, it was crazy. And in fact, um, Madeline Sis, who was uh, our director and leader for so uh, many years, and did such a wonderful job. And uh, she would say, "Don't say anything about a book, for God's sake." They call me every week and say, "When's the book? When's the book?" Well, anyway. I am doing it, but I learned something from a teacher, a great, I think a really successful writer who's publishing her own works and things. But anyway, I learned that you know, I'm not a writer, <laughs> so that's worth a lot. Uh, and, uh, but she is writing for me, and uh, we are well into the process. And it's going to be a spiritual memoir. I don't know if you know what that genre is exactly. It's not a history of my life. Uh, my friends are not going to be in it. They'll be disappointed. <laughs> uh, but basically, uh, it's, uh, 
It's what's happened to me that's changed me and led me to where I am today. My spiritual journey. And um, there are many things in there that I've never talked about in talks, but um, they were very powerful. So, there is going to be a book, and I think probably by, believe it or not, <laughs> by, by Christmas. She promises a manuscript by June, so we'll see. I know, don't, don't say it, but I had to say it. I want to say it. Sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. Having sisters is wonderful. They're over there giving me stretches. <laughs> okay. Now, I left off with a strong kind of statement, I think, I hope, about God of the Old Testament. And God of the Old Testament had a task to accomplish, and it included being the source of everything. So you can read in Scripture, scholars talk about the Old Testament saying that God was the source of all good and the source of all evil. Now, that doesn't mean God literally was the source of evil. It just means that in the story, it is written so that it seems that God is the one who causes punishment against those who displease him or those who choose another God. And the image of going out and killing people who don't believe in God in the Old Testament lingers today. There are still people who feel they have a right to maybe not murder, but certainly condemn and criticize and, and cut people out. And what the thing that I want you to feel with me is that this God who is those things in the Old Testament lingers in the New Testament when it comes to the life of Jesus. And if there's anything I want you to do with me for a few moments or the rest of the morning is try to put the Old Testament where it belongs, a source of wisdom for people at a certain level of consciousness where all they could fundamentally understand is justice and the idea of a single God. Now evolution of consciousness is kind of tricky because it's also called something that's negative and that's called modernism. Anybody hear modernism? Modernism is a way of imagining life where everything evolves and changes. And one of the things that is very frightening to my more pious conservative brothers and sisters who are so well-intentioned, but I think caught in something that isn't really fully, authentically Christian, but they really believe that the things that were taught in the past are still applied to the future and that they cannot change. What cannot change is truth. They're right. There is something that doesn't change. Truth is always true. If there's anything that I would ask you to seek when you think about holiness, which to me is something about being sinless, don't think about that as the goal of Christianity. The goal of Christianity, your faith, is truth. I want to know the truth. Who am I? Who is God? Who is Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit? What am I here for? What's going on, you know? And I cannot help but feel completely confident in saying we have changed over the years. I mean, it's so clear. When they say the teaching of the church can't change and you look at the teaching in the Old Testament, it's rather interesting that some of the things that they say were forbidden were things that we do now without any question. You can't eat, have anybody eaten a strangled animal lately? You know, that's, that's, you know, that's in the same list as whether or not, um, whether you have relations with somebody that's, that's illegitimate or whatever. You know, I mean, it's like, I'm not saying that that's no longer the case. I'm just simply saying, how can you not understand that people change and need a new understanding or are made for a new understanding of who God is? And that's what I teach and preach most, the whole idea of we are a body of people growing in our understanding of all things. The truth never changes. We see it more clearly and let go of things that are not literally the truth. 
And when you're dealing with love in a relationship, boy, that's tough if you're going to start looking at actions only. The saddest thing for me growing up as a Catholic in the 40s and 50s was I was taught an action-centered religion. Moral actions are what make you a good or bad Christian. And then you add to that the shame and guilt that goes along with feeling that you're not a good Christian. But the, there's way in which that leads to a church that is fear-based. Fear-based. I mean, that's what religion has always been for me. I'm afraid I'm not going to be good enough. I'm afraid that I will not be responsive enough, that I won't teach what the church teaches, that I'll, you know, that I'll miss... I won't help somebody like I want to help them. All, all this stuff is the pressure of we have, the pressure I've been under that you've been under most likely is when you are required to do it right and do it correctly. And, they, and the result, if you don't, is not a learning lesson, but a condemnation from God. You're fear based. What is the most common thing in the, in the world today, if you're going to talk to somebody who understands human evolution and human consciousness and what a human deals with, one of the most dangerous things that is that we're living in an enormous amount of stress. Stress. Stress leads to all kinds of negative feelings. Shame. I'm stressed that I'm not good enough. Anger, I'm stressed the world isn't really working for me. I've been cheated. Fear, anger, shame, guilt, all those things are lingering things in a person's psyche when they do not understand one simple, powerful statement that comes from the action of Jesus Christ. You are forgiven. You're forgiven. The Old Testament was about sin and about judgment and about a call to following rules and regulations. Unabashedly, that's, it's it. that's what it is. Then the New Testament comes, and it's hard to shake the Old Testament for those of us who preach and teach the New Testament because we use the Old Testament a lot. And one of the things that we learned before the council was a way of understanding scripture that was new to the church. It's called historical criticism. And it means that anytime you read something in scripture that God says to someone or Jesus says to someone, you have to take into account what the circumstances were and what he was trying to get across. That's a major difference in looking at a phrase in scripture where God says, I want to kill you all, and you think that's what he says to people who aren't Catholic. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, he said, if you don't do what I, if you don't believe in me the way I teach, you know, I mean, so it's so interesting that when I say that, it's sort of humorous that we say, well, of course we don't take the Old Testament and think it applies to all things, but we do, preachers do. God said in the Old Testament, you know, and that's for you now in Dallas, Texas, 2024. That's what God is saying to you now, too. Same thing. Well, the truth that he speaks is eternal and is, is real. But everything he says is designed around a work that he has with us, opening our consciousness to who he is. So he's working with the people as they were then and not as they are now. Are they different? Yes. I think radically different. I don't feel like I would fit in the world that I lived in in the 40s and 50s for more than 30 minutes. I'd be screaming, you know. When I watch people do things to each other, like happens in a family of origin, I'd look at it and I'd say, well, this is family life. And then I lived in a family where I tried to please everyone, most especially my mother, and then I learned that if my value was dependent on somebody else's feeling toward me, I had a disease. What? A disease? I was a good boy. No, the disease is called codependency. The religion that we live in tends to 
I think, support, no, the religion we've been taught that is not what we should believe in is that we've been taught over and over again that pleasing people is a way to express love. I never confronted my mother on her, her problems because I had to please her. I never want to teach or preach anything that's not officially Catholic because I want to please another mother, Mother Church. I had a needy mother and a needy church. <laughs> and I want to take care of both of them. I mean, it's, it's in my DNA. I can't help it. And I used to, when I was preaching at St. Thomas Aquinas after I'd retired, I was always going back to my place and sitting down saying, oh, shoot. I think I'm going to upset, I think I just upset some people, and sure enough, they'd be out there. You can't say that God is not judgmental. And I said, he's not. Well, it says, and to live, to judge the living and the dead. And I said, okay, okay. I do have to explain this, I will. Okay, so judgment, Oxford English Dictionary, judgment is creating a form of authority over someone and is offering them a way of life. That's what a judgment is. I'm judging you, like a doctor will come in and say, well, are you sleeping well? He's judging you, right? Uh, well, how about your diet? Or the more embarrassing things get about the lower parts of the body and you say, no, no. Anyway, but my point being, Judgment is questioning whether something is the way it is. Condemnation is what I pray judgment is, sounds like to a lot of people when it comes to God judges you. He condemns you. If you don't seek forgiveness through the institution, God condemns you. What does condemn mean? It is not redeemable. It can't be fixed. It's terminal. The car will never run again. <laughs> the building can never house anyone. It's condemned. For me to teach in any way, shape, or form to a group of people that God condemns sinners is absolutely abhorrent to me. That's like a doctor you go to. Remember Jesus said, I'm a doctor, right? People need to come to me who are sick. And what am I going to do? Tell them that they're going to, that they, they can't belong, they can't come to a hospital because they're sick, you know? This hospital is about well people. This religion is about people who follow the rules and do what they're told. My pious brothers and sisters that are more conservative, they love two things. They love the emotion of a religion where they can stand in awe of the blessed sacrament. They are addicted to the blessed sacrament in a, in a way that could be, I'm not judging them literally, I'm just saying it could be that they tend to feel that if they're in the presence of God in the tabernacle, presence of Jesus, presence of God in, in Jesus, in the, in the host, God, I'm all right, then, then they're close to God. If they walk out, he's not there as much. Is that what the Eucharist is? I mean, really? Yes, it is a mystery, it is mystical, it is a powerful image, but the most powerful part of it is not its reservation, which is a beautiful thing, and to pray in the presence of the Eucharist is wonderful. But the thing that is so interesting to me that the most important thing about Eucharist is what Vatican Council did to change it from an event that, that occurred across a little communion rail, on the other side of the communion rail, I know in St. Bernard's when I was there, the, I wanted to renovate the church. I have a terrible reputation of, before Father Don shows up at a church that he's just been assigned to, four dumpsters come up in front of the church. <laughs> oh my God, you know. But babe, back to my image. In that church, the people, the flooring of the people was linoleum, rolls of, a big roll of linoleum. The sanctuary was um, tra ter um, terrazzo. And then the place where the priest said the mass was, was marble. 
<laughs> and so I'm thinking, okay, there's a hierarchy here of all these people, you know, like, okay, so we in the, in the ordinary place are uh, less, less worthy than those that are on the other side of the railing <clears throat> are basically longing for something. And that person there is the one who gets it and gives it to us as long as we're worthy. When people say at a mass before, don't come to communion unless you are worthy, my body just goes cringes. Um, that I know the intention there is to honor the role the church has to call us to holiness. Yes, it's important. But to come to the Eucharist hungry and longing for it makes so much sense to me, and it isn't really focusing on whether you're worthy or not. I could see someone who doesn't worry about whether they're worthy or not and goes and does it, totally wrote, and doesn't mean much of anything. What the Vatican Council did, and it was so important that I was, I was rooted and grounded in my understanding of the Vatican Council by working with the liturgical commission in the Diocese of Dallas for 35, 36 years. And I had to plan with people, I had to help them plan the way a new church would be built according to the documents of Vatican II. And it didn't make much sense at all to people who didn't understand the nature and the, 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 the teaching of Vatican II because it goes something like this. The most potent and the most wonderful and powerful experience we can have as believers is worship, communal worship. Catholicism, Christianity, it just doesn't, it can't exist. It's not a private religion. You have to be engaged with others in a relationship. And the beauty and the power of that relationship that you have with one another is founded on a place where God has promised to put his presence inside the hearts of every human being. I love that teaching that the heart is the center of a human being's spiritual energy and life and the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart. In the Oxford English Dictionary, there is more, more times that the scripture talks about heart than it does about love, because love is the heart infused with divine presence. When we together in the liturgy gather around a priest, and as a people of God who share in the priesthood of the priest, share in priesthood, meaning that we all have an obligation to do what I'm doing right now. Not that you have to speak these words to people, but you all take on, as a Christian, the ability to be a priest, which is a Christ, a Christ figure that sees others with the eyes of God and longs for nothing more than for them to experience the freedom of everything that keeps them from being who they truly are. What keeps them from authenticity? Isn't it interesting, the miracles of Jesus are primarily therapeutic. And then one other category, driving out demons. That's a whole other topic, demons. I think we know them. They take all kinds of forms. My little demon was constantly whispering in my ear, be a good little boy, be a good little boy. Please everybody, <clears throat> make everybody in the room like you. If they do like you, you'll start maybe liking yourself. I'll never be without that demon, but he doesn't have any control over me now like he used to. Two summers ago, I. I had to cancel every talk I was planning on giving because I couldn't have, I didn't have any confidence in what God has given me. I just, excuse me. I just experienced the demon taking over my life and I was so dark and so afraid I had panic attacks, which I've never had in my life. I couldn't sleep for months. And uh, 
sometimes not for three days in a row. That was the worst. But all of that was the confrontation ultimately with my demon. And I had done so many things that allowed him to take on more power without even realizing it till I realized I had not made my decision that I had this gift, this power inside of me that isn't me, that can flow through me and do anything that God wants me to do. I didn't believe that because of the gnawing experience of my, know, I know my sins, I know the mistakes I've made. I'm not what people think I am in many ways. If I let that happen to me, the best thing that can happen to any of us with that kind of a situation is to finally see and face the demon and say, get the blank out of here. <laughs> Leave me, leave me. But more than that, it's something quite different. That's me making it leave. God, take this demon out of my life, please. I don't think I could say that if I didn't feel what it was like to have the demon. I let the demon be just there enough to keep me on edge, to keep me in stress, to keep me worried, to keep me pushing myself to try to make everything better than it was. If the church didn't look like the Vatican Council Church, I had to change it. When I left my father, when I left my, my house shortly before my dad died, uh, he walked me to the front door and and I said goodbye and I I was there to <laughs> to wash the carpet in the in the den because it was dirty where he was sitting and um, I knew that would please him and he said Don you know I I've never said this but there's not a thing in this house you haven't touched or changed I said I know you know I know. And I put my life on hold to do that in some ways. But all I'm doing right now in sharing this with you is not to do anything other than to say there is a way in which one thing that demons will do, which is their greatest weakness, is they take over and you can't live with them. And then you can change. Then you can change. And I didn't realize how much power I'd given that part of me. I thought I'd gotten rid of it in... If anybody knows the Meadows and Pia Melody's work, I mean, I always love meeting gra fellow graduates from that program. <laughs> I've, I've done work on myself. I've done, um, gosh, years and years and years of therapy, still in therapy with um, Jungian analysts. And, and I don't mean every week, but I mean, I still do it. And uh, yeah, and I uh, went to those places with the hope and the dream that I could get free of things, and I did a lot better than I could have without them. But they weren't the same as what happened la the two summers ago. That was God asking me to confront with his power, not mine, with his power, this demon that I could name. And I didn't know it was keeping me from being authentically who I am. And the authenticity, that's everything. Because that's you living as God intends you to live in this world that we live in with the obligation and the, the, the joy of being an instrument of freeing other people from demons and freeing people from those things they keep them from walking where they should, hands that don't work, eyes that don't see, ears that don't see. You know, I mean, everything that Jesus is saying, I've given you the power because I dwell in your heart. And if I, if I dwell in your heart, you know who really is dwelling in your heart? You know who you should focus on? Not me. Focus on God living in your heart. The disciples, when Jesus talked about God, they said, well, we don't know God. I mean, how... Who is he? We don't know who he is. He said, how can, Jesus says, how can you ask, 
How can you say to me, show me who God is when you're looking at him? I'm God. I'm the God that hasn't been fully revealed yet. I'm the God that loves beyond measure. I'm the God that will never turn my back on anyone. And that's who I've always been, but you weren't ready. You didn't know it. Because if I gave that to people who are, it's like when somebody, when I tell somebody about, you got to let people make their own moral decisions. And this guy said, I'm a, I'm a chaplain in, in a university. You think I'm going to tell people that? Tell them that? Make your own decisions about these moral issues? I say, yeah, you're supposed to. <laughs> but it's like, no, they're not ready. It's almost like the church feels at times that the church isn't ready to receive the obligation and the privilege of being the one who makes their own decisions and moral issues that are complicated and tricky and can only find a solution that is, is authentic by going to God. And I love the Vatican Council that talks about the dignity of human beings, and it's probably the most important thing the council talks about. The church has always been seen pretty much as the clergy. See a bunch of clergy around, you say, well, there's the church, you know. A clergy in a room, there's the church. A room without a clergy could be any kind of group. So the image of the church as being the instrument of God, and that is the sole instrument that you are that's available to you, is terrifying to me because it means a priest can get up, as I've listened to priests say things to people, that are absolutely destructive. That's the trouble with, there's mass, you know, now I can listen, you know, I never used to be able to listen to priests talking, but, you know, teaching or preaching, and, and now they're on... They're on TV, <laughs> and I can see them. And I'm talking most especially, not alone, I mean, I'm talking across all denominations, not just Catholic priests, but I'm the Catholic ones I listen to the most. But at times they can seem with every good intention in the world that they want to say the Vatican Council is evil and that we need to go back to the way it was, that we're not going to live in the future, we're not going to talk about the future, we're going to talk about the past, and we are going to give you advice that you must, must follow or you're not Catholic. That's not an unusual theme to listen to a homily. Nor is it unusual to hear a homily basically tell you, you should be better, you're not good enough. That doesn't help anyone, I don't think. If I'm feeling bad about myself and I'm feeling like I just don't, I can't make it, God's not pleased with me, and I go to church and the priest says, you know, God isn't pleased with sinners. You know, you're just not, you got to be better. Why do I have to be better? Well, because God wants you to be better. Well, what's better? Perfection of performance or presence or presence? You being, resonating from your heart, this divine presence inside of you is your mandate. That's who you have to be. If you focus more on you being divinely infused with, with, with God, which is what happens at liturgy, that's what I wanted to say about it. The liturgy is considered to be an experience of the presence of God fulfilling the promise that when a priest is present and you all are present and you believe in that bread is no longer bread but the body of Christ, the wine is no longer just wine but the blood of Christ, one nurtures you and the other forgives you. It's an Our Father in action. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, let me be my authentic self. Thy will be done. Let me align my will to yours. And God didn't go, Jesus didn't go around worrying about his relationship with God as much as he worried about how he could help other people. That's what we're here for. Give us this day our daily bread. The presence of the Holy Spirit living inside my heart resonating to you. And forgive us our trespasses. That's the wine, forgiveness. 
The Our Father is the only prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. So you know you're praying for the right things. To say, oh my God, you are so holy, you're so awesome. You have loved me from the beginning. You've called me into the world to live with these people that I'm living with. And all I want to do is be able to resonate your wisdom from my heart to their heart. And I don't need to say anything. I don't need to lay hands on them. I don't need to tell them that they're wrong or right or whatever. I just need to know you're doing that. Is that really what you're doing? That's the thing I've had the hardest time accepting because it seems too far from what I learned in my religion. I had to earn the presence of God. I listen to friends that are, I think, as, you know, that are on a different page than I am with religion. They're still on the page where it's about performance and guilt and shame and condemnation. Sin is the big issue. And if you're going to be looking at yourself constantly through a filter of whether you're a sin or not, if you're honest and authentic, you have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinner. A sinner is nothing other than a person who isn't yet fully who God intends them to be and doing things that are not really helpful. When you present yourself to someone as someone you're not thinking you're helping them, it doesn't help at all. Because performance, the action, the words... Those things are only effective if attached to a presence that lives inside of you. And that's nothing more than aligning your will with God's will, saying, I'm here because I want everyone in this room to feel you, know you, be freed of excessive shame, guilt, fear. I want them to be enjoying this incredible experience of being a partner with you in bringing life to the people around me. It's effortless when it's done as God intends it. He's not asking everyone to take on everyone else's problem. If you look at people with the eyes of Christ, think of this, look at each other with the eyes of Christ, and what you would see is the perfection that he has called you to be, that you are it's covered over, it's been damaged, it's been dented, it's been broken. Think of the things that happen to us when we come into this world. People question, do we come in with a completely, you know, blank slate? Most likely not. Ask any mother who's had children, talk about their children when even they first saw them. This one's an old soul. This one's brand new. He doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> you know, I mean, we don't come into the, exactly the same. In fact, I'm swearing that brothers and sisters are destined to be separate and different. And if you're with different and separated people, then you can grow in what, you, what they... They have gifts that you don't have, and if you're competing with those gifts, you're not going to make it. But if you're working with learning from each other, you're going to do something wonderful. So looking at somebody and seeing them as God sees them and wanting nothing more as an intention to join the intention of God through the intention that he has in your heart as the Holy Spirit resonating out of you and moving that person closer to authenticity, which is dealing with their own demons, their own struggles. I get so tired of people talking about religion, you know? I mean, meaning telling people what they have to do. I'm, 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 I hope I'm not sounding like I'm doing that. I'm telling you what I think I believe. I'm telling you what I know is true. And it's not what the church taught me. I don't ever remember the church telling me that I was a tabernacle. And in me is God resonating. I read things in scripture that says, do not ever do anything wrong with your body because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. What's that mean? He lives inside of here. When the Vatican Council talks about human conscience, the conscience that a human being has, it says in the council documents 
There is a place within every human being, a tabernacle, where their God dwells. And when there is a moral decision that is difficult for you, you go to that place, you talk to God, and you listen to him, and you must follow what he teaches, what he says. And even if it isn't objectively the right thing, you still have to follow your conscience. How many times have you heard that from the pulpit? Not many. I never heard it. Well, I shouldn't take that back. I took that back. I did hear it in, when I was in the seminary. I, I was one of those unique individuals, there weren't that many of us, who actually was in the seminary during the Vatican Council, and I, I learned the Vatican Council as a seminarian, and I doubt if it was taught in most seminaries. But I did learn these things, and it is, it has transformed me. It has transformed me. When I go to a dinner party now, when I walk into any room, I have an intention. I don't say it out loud. I don't go up to somebody and say, you know what I'm doing for you right now? It's, it's going to be great. Uh, you'll feel it in about 45 minutes, maybe. You know, no, I just, I just, I have this intention. I see these people as God sees them. He sees you with enormous love, and he looks at all of you and said, I just want you to feel the love I have for you, and that is going to come in the form of healing. You're a healer when you carry the presence of God in your heart. The... Uh, please don't think that I'm making fun of anyone, because no matter what anyone believes, I truly believe they're sincere in what they're believing, even though it may not, it may be a little out of balance. But I can remember so often with the um, Eucharistic adoration at the parish, and I remember this happens now and then. I can tell a few other stories. But they draw, it just, it's, thinking what I just said, you can understand what my reaction was, but they, they would come to me and say, oh, Father, Father, I went in the chapel and no one was there, and Jesus was alone. So I stayed until someone came, and, and then I was able to leave. I said, was he lonely? You know, yeah, he was lonely. And I, I thought, okay, that presence in there you have a sensitivity toward. What would it be like if you had that same sensitivity toward your own heart, your own tabernacle? and you felt a dignity and a value that you walked with God, not because you earned it through not sinning, but because he chose to live there and chose you to be aware of that so that we together are church, and it's whenever two or three are gathered together, aligned with God's will, and we're there saying, I long for you to become everything you're intended to be. Wow. Fill a room with that, and it would be incredible, absolutely incredible. And that's what Eucharist is supposed to be. The Vatican Council. Let's look at the fundamental issue that the council was trying to take care of. First and foremost, there was a pope, Pope Pius X, if anybody knows more, my more conservative brothers and sisters, look to him as the real pope, not the present pope. I'm amazed that, that this pope is the first pope ever to take seriously the teachings of the Vatican Council and wanting them to be lived out as God intends. Pope Francis, first pope to ever take the name of Francis, the most popular saint in our tradition. But what's interesting about the way in which, let me tell you one thing more, just a little sidebar. When I was so excited about the Vatican Council, was so thrilled, I was giving a talk to uh, in, in a parish as I was a deacon, I wasn't yet ordained, and I was telling him about the wonderful thing about the council that everyone is a we all share in the priesthood of God, and therefore we have a right to be holy. And I, by holy, I mean holy, not 
good but holy. And the priest afterwards took me aside and said, what the hell are you doing? It takes years to be holy. You have to give up so much to be holy. You can't go around telling people they're holy. And I was, to be honest, I was, oh, I'm, you know, like, I guess I'm wrong. You know, for, you know I mean, I didn't, I said, well, I think, I think so. I think that's what, I think that's what the council said. I wasn't quite that naive, but, you know, I wasn't, I, I didn't have what the stability I had now. But think about that. God has said through the council to the church, the most important means through which the church can be in touch with the God who longs to teach it and to keep it moving in the direction it needs to move. It needs to evolve with people. It needs to be different. And so everyone is holy. It's a choice to believe it or not. Does that mean they're all safe and that no one who is holy will do anything wrong? No, it doesn't mean that at all. There are people broken who were disconnected from wholeness. They're not who they were intended to be and they're dangerous and they're destructive to self and others. So evil is real. But it's real to the level, it's, it, it's most dangerous and most powerful when it is hidden and not faced. Nothing is better than facing your own demons. What about another person that you love that is caught in a demon, an addiction, a pattern of behavior that's destructive? What are you supposed to do with that? Change them? Fix them, take them in, take care of them, maybe. But the main thing is looking at them and knowing that you have within you an ability to lift them into the light, not all at once, but a little at a time, and they will change. And it's not your responsibility to change them. God, why did we ever get caught in that? You have a family member that is really hurting and in problem and they just seem to devour everyone that comes near them in terms of their needs and their wants and you do it because that's what you're supposed to do. Well, yes and no. Yes, you do have to help when you can, no doubt. But you're not, if you're just saying, I'll get them a good meal, I'll, I'll take care of their rent, I'll, I'll do whatever I have to do. But if you're not believing in what you really can do, it's like you're not engaged in the church. The church is human beings filled with the tabernacle like a church has a tabernacle in them and they move through the world and they move people toward truth. I went into St. Thomas Aquinas the other day, a church, the first church I ever went to and um, they painted the inside. They made a couple of mistakes, but I didn't go with it. I would have done it a little differently. No, it's, I'm bad. Anyway, but back to that. And I haven't been, I haven't been in a church in a long time. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I have mass in my, with my family in my home, and that's been my church for the last well, I've been retired now 14 years, so that, that would say that's been, I don't know how long ago it's been I stopped working at St. Thomas. But when I was in there, an overwhelming feeling came to me. There were two things happening in the room. One was a woman kneeling at the tabernacle, leaning into the tabernacle, I mean, toward it, bent over. Like, I want to get closer, but I can't. This, this, this thing is here. And the other was a man, two men waiting to go, two men, they gotta use this hand for this and this for this. <laughs> anyway, the other were two men waiting to go to confession. And I was, you know, and it was quiet and it was beautiful. It was well cared for. And I just said, you know, churches are really powerful places. Yes, we can be a building 
we can be in a building that does so much to increase our awareness of what we are as carriers of God's presence in us. We, we, it, you know, you don't need a church, but, but, you, but churches are so much a part of this. Ritual is so much a part of us. You know, the rituals we had, remember during COVID, we didn't have many rituals. You know, and I, I didn't even know what, I, what month is it? We didn't have Thanksgiving. We didn't have Christmas. We, you know, I don't know. We're, we're, we, we need to have things that draw us to a routine. You know, it's good. It's valuable. So um, back to the council. Dignity of the human being is pre, uh, preeminent in this council. You are important, valued, powerful. The hierarchy is there to serve you. The hierarchy is there to empower you, and are you ready? Not to tell you what to do. Not to tell you what to do. Not to tell you how to believe. Meaning by saying that, not telling you this, and unless you do it, you're out. That's what I'm talking about. To say to somebody, you have to believe this way. Okay, but I, you know, something in me just, I don't know, doesn't make sense, doesn't work for me. What would the church do prior to Vatican II if you were a Catholic and said, this thing isn't working for me? They would say, well, you have a choice. You can leave the church and go to hell, or you can stay and change your mind. And if you don't change your mind, you got to change your actions because you got to look right. You got to do right. I mean, think of that. The church has never been intended to overpower an individual's dignity and rights. And it has throughout centuries. And it's when it doesn't work. It doesn't work. What was the problem with the Pharisees? The idea of a God person, a, a person in their midst that was filled with God doing the miracles that he did was such a conundrum for them because they can't write him off as a, as a weirdo. If they listened just to his teaching and knew it was so far from what the church was teaching as far as the temple was teaching, laws, rules, regulations, you know, they, they had to silence him somehow. But he wouldn't have had the impact if he wasn't a healer. And I don't think the church can ever have its impact on the world unless you see yourselves as healers. Not in a literal sense where you're laying hands on people and their diseases go away, that you go to the hospital and pray for everyone in the hospital that they all be healed and because of you they'll be healed. Nothing like that. Think of it again as personal, one to one, one to a few, one to the world too. But the fact that you have this gift that is part of the healing of the world, and when you give it, the world itself is lifted up to a higher level of consciousness, which is knowing what is true and living it out. It seems so beautiful and so easy for me to say this is a church that I love, empowering each of us to be what you call us to be. And, and we know that you gave us certain gifts and certain talents. And so are we supposed to have all those other talents? So if we, no, you just do your thing, be you. Nobody ever told me to be myself, ever. Be a good little boy, be what we need you to be, be on time, don't come in late. It's so interesting to me how psychologically and spiritually I could see someone evolved who looks at all this and says, this, is, this, is, this doesn't make sense. So guess what they do? They don't go to church anymore. Why? There's nothing there for them. The Eucharist doesn't work for them in that environment. I'm not saying Christ isn't really present, it is. I'm just saying if they're so separated from this institution, the institution is going to be able to have the impact on you that you need. And so what did the Vatican Council change? You don't have to be Catholic to be saved. 
You don't. You don't have to believe in God to be saved. You don't have to believe in Jesus to be saved. Those are all quotes from the Holy Father. What does it mean? Does it mean that God is the only means of salvation? It means that the church may not be the best way to find the God that is the center of our lives. So the church in the Vatican Council said, and the, the language is really tricky, but I want to be fair, absolutely. It says, if you believe that the Roman Catholic Church is the one true church by God and you leave it, you go to hell. But if you are seeking the truth and seeking God and choose to use another religion instead of the church, you have an obligation to follow it in conscience. If you are a member of another church, say you're a mother, another religion, and then if you decide or if you were brought up in that religion and you've been taught it your whole life and you're a good Buddhist or a good Hindu follower or a really wonderful um, a Muslim in the faith, do, do they, are they not able to be saved? Of course they can be. They have a right to worship their religion that they believe in their heart. The church has never said that in 2,000 years. And people try to say, oh, well, it didn't really mean that. Yeah, it did. I mean, I think it did. I know it did. It wants so much for God to be a part of him. If the religion they're caught in is keeping them from that, he will direct them somewhere else. Many of my Protestant brothers and sisters and ministers that I know say, well, the Catholic Church said all that, but they really want everybody to be Catholic. <laughs> And I say, well, yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, we, we believe we have the oldest, longest running show in town and that we have a long history of people like Bonaventure and Tom. We, we do have a lot going for us, but that is such a, a, a narrow way of imagining it when you think about people who are born in families and, and they're given a faith and it's around a particular tradition and the core of the both traditions are the same, but the means with which you will use to get to them is different. And if that difference fits you, it seems to me the church is saying, then please do whatever you can to find a way of finding me. Find me inside of you. If the church doesn't tell you that, I think you'd say scripture might say, well, if you don't see God as the source of truth, I don't know, you're not really necessarily a believer, but does that mean you're cut out and he has no interest in you? Absolutely not. He wants more than anything else for any one of us to be in a deep, positive, wonderful relationship with him. So the saying that the church is not the only church, saying that a person has personal conscience to make their own decisions, to say that the laity is the heart of the church, to say the servants are the clergy, so radically changes the church that I grew up in that it's hard to imagine a change like that could happen. What was happening when the council happened? One thing I don't think I mentioned is that that priest that told me, or maybe I didn't tell you this, when I was excited about the Vatican Council and came and said, oh, I got it, I got it, this is wonderful. And everybody looked at me like, what? You know, no, it's not, I mean, not the clergy were the most resistant. The clergy really said, Vatican Council is wrong and it will be changed eventually back. And um, I remember them saying things like, you can't consecrate the Eucharist with English. It's impossible. You know, I mean, I mean, really, it was so, I mean, I looked on it then, I was angry, but I look now on it with such compassion for these men who believed this and taught this forever, and then it's sort of like, well, not exactly that way. You know, it's not exactly, you're not actually in charge of anybody. You're there to awaken them to a God that will guide them. You don't need to make all their decisions for them. That's a radical change. I remember when parish councils were called for in the church, laity having an impact on the way the pastor spent money 
or did things, getting permission from the lay people. I mean, they were, they were furious. Not in my church will there ever be a parish council. I will never turn the altar in my church around. Those are quotes from pulpits in Dallas when I was a young priest. And they did what they had to. But to be honest, for most, that's all they did. And I don't blame them. I mean, it was a, it's a, it's a turning the thing upside down. I mean, think about it. You're not in charge anymore? Well, of course you are in certain ways. I lived in a parish, my first parish, St. Thomas Aquinas. And there was a priest that was the pastor there. He was a well-respected pastor from Poland. I wish he'd been from Italy, but anyway. <laughs> but anyway, um, you all, many of you know who he is. He's dead, and, or he's, he's died. He's alive, but he's died. And, uh, and he was my first pastor, and I wanted to please him. And I remember once some wait ladies told me, oh, Father John said, you're really good. And, and I went, really, really? He never said that to me, ever. He was supposed to be my spiritual mentor. As I go to a parish as a young priest, the older pastors to take me under his wing and guide me through and show me the things that we do as a Catholic priest in Dallas, Texas in 1967. And I'll never forget my first call on the phone. Many of you heard me tell this story, maybe. But it's such a pivotal story of my first entrance into a post-Vatican period into a pre-Vatican church. And um, I was told when I was there that I would have a certain schedule to my life. I would not be able to preach on, uh, I would not preach on daily mass because that was just, we didn't do that. And I would only preach uh, once a month because there were enough priests there that we didn't, rather than have to work on a homily every weekend, we could only do one a month, and that was so much easier on the priest. Okay, and uh, so I had about, I was there two years, so I did about, you know, 24 homilies or whatever. <laughs> now, and then I was told that I had to be available two days out of the week ready to put on my cassock if the doorbell rang and I was there for any information. Like a little thing, info here, you know. And that was my days. So I had to do other, you know, just kind of lounge around. Then I had to go, to, one day I had to go to the nursing homes and the other day I had to go to uh, the hospitals. That was, and, and I had to, I had to ma say mass, hear confessions, baptize, do weddings. That was it. I will tell you that when I was first thinking about being a priest, it struck, me, struck, it struck me in times that it was so simple. I mean, who can't learn the sacraments? They're not that difficult to do. You memorize them and work on them. You have, you have a book in front of you. you. Ever heard of a Protestant minister say, you guys get away with murder. Everything you say is already written down. We gotta make ours up, you know? <laughs> I said, well, we make up the homily. Come on, give us a break, anyway. But back to St. Thomas Aquinas, 1967. I knew exactly my place, and it wasn't difficult. Oh, and I had to take care of the youth, I had to CYO. I actually made a little office for myself in a closet in uh, the gym, and, or off the, the multi-purpose room. And I'll never forget, <laughs> Father John came in, looked at it, went, then walked away. And then I heard him one day when he was, we were watching the news and there was a nun playing guitar. And he said, if that's the church, I'm leaving it. A nun playing guitar. Kumbaya or something, you know, just, it was so ingrained in him that this was the, uh, uh, not a good direction. So what happened was I had my first sick call and that's the hardest thing that I thought I would ever have to do is to go when there was a tragedy of somebody's death, especially if it was sudden. So God knew exactly what he was doing with me because he took me to an apartment by a phone call that called me and said, will you please come? We've called our parish priest. He doesn't answer. Would you please come? 
My friend's fiance has just been killed in an automobile accident. The wedding is next week, was to be next week. So I got in my little uh, Pontiac Le Mans, gray with a vinyl top, eight track blaring, and I went down Gaston Road to the hospital, to the place, and I'll never forget the feeling I had. I just, how could, what do you say? You know, your, your fiance, your husband-to-be in a couple of days is dead. So I didn't say anything when I came in. I just kind of looked at her and I just held her for a while and just looked at her and held her. And she starts talking. She said, Father, you got to answer my question. I said, what is it? You know. He wanted to make love to me constantly, begged me, begged me, begged me. And I said no, because God said no. And then God took him away from me. So how, who's God? Who is he? And thank God I didn't give her any answer. I mean, I just sat there. I mean, I must have said some words, but I didn't try to say he's better off now. He's in heaven with God. Or worse, I thought of later that a priest could have said, and rightly could have said, in light of the church at the time, well, you're so lucky, my dear, because if you didn't do that, he would be in hell. So you just saved your boyfriend from hell, so why are you crying? I'm a little exaggerating that. But that's the way it would have been heard. And all I remember is driving back to the house wishing they had made love. <laughs> Sorry. That was me. Then I get to the rectory, go to bed. It was three or four in the morning when I got to bed and, and uh, went to the, to the dining room table with its white tablecloth and two maids working on us. One was making my bed, the other one was cooking my breakfast. And he was sitting in his usual chair at the head of the table with his pa newspaper open. And I started talking to him. I said, you'll never guess what. I went on this trip, I went on this thing. It was, it was incredible, it was so, I mean, ah. And uh, he never, he did. He put the paper down once and said, what was the address? I said, um, near the hospital on Gaston Avenue. He said, that's not our parish. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I know. I said, no, the, the, but the, they, they called their priest and he wasn't there. And I went and he said, don't ever do that again. And took back the paper and never said a word. That was my first real experience of having my heart awakened by a Vatican Council and encountering a rigid, judgmental, and controlling religion. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to live in that. But I never, ever thought about leaving. And my friends left in droves. I had nine people in the seminary with me, and six of them left the priesthood in the first five years after Vatican II. Same way with um, the priests who were ordained from other parish or from other seminaries, rather, came together, and we would have conferences with each other. We'd, we, they said, you need to get together and form small communities and take care of each other. I was in a community with uh, three other priests, four of us, and we met every month for an afternoon or for, for a full day. And after two years of struggling with what we were dealing with, three of them left the priesthood. Close friends. And I'm sitting there saying, well, I can't, I can't leave. Maybe I just needed to be a good little boy and not to disappoint Mother Church, but I think it was more than that. I think it was because I think God felt he could maybe get to me <laughs> and help me to teach this thing that I believe so deeply the council is all about. The dignity of a human being, the right of human consciousness, the lack of condemnation for people who have different inclinations sexually, 
the Holy Father has done such an incredible job in trying to install something that was 50 years ago. And that priest that was, I was going to tell you, that told me, it'll be 50 years before the council will ever even be known what it is. So slow down. <laughs> You're not going to be living in it very much. And I said, well, okay. I just didn't believe him, basically. 50 years was forever. Now I'm 84 years, and that doesn't seem very long at all. <laughs> I mean, whoa, just getting started. No, but anyway, back to, uh, back to that priest. And he said, 50 years. And so I thought, the first pope ever to be able to really demand and call the church to the Vatican Council's teaching was Pope Francis. And uh, he has been hated, um, demeaned, called by some bishop in Texas, a demonic clown, taking away the foundation of our faith, the, the body of beliefs, that 50 cardinals signed a letter. These are cardinals who are in, have lived in Rome for a long time. They are the board of trustees of the church in a way. They guide the Pope and help to make decisions. And 50 of them signed a letter and said, you are an imposter and the Holy Spirit made a mistake. God made a mistake. I don't know what they're going to say. You know, that he should not be Pope. But all they were saying is, we will not change. We will not open our heart to what this teaching is that came from the Holy Spirit to the church in the 60s. And when you look at where we've come from the 60s to now, in terms of evolution, of understanding things that were sinful, but allowed and didn't think much about them. Integration, segregation, all those, all, all the women's rights, all these things seem to be a, a, a fruit of a council that said human beings have a right to be who they are. Men are not better than women. One color skin is not better than another. One sexual preference of one person is not better than another. That's what the church is trying to say. And it still is resisted. But you know, it's okay because that's what it takes. <laughs> you know, how do you? How can you change something like this? But what am I hopeful about? Think of what's going on now that wasn't going on even 25 years ago. I'll use an example. The pandemic. Has there ever been an event in the history of the world? that has affected every single person practically on this planet. Because of our mobility, the disease was everywhere. Has there ever been a pandemic before? Absolutely. Has it ever covered the world? Never. Has there ever been a possibility that I could send something out on the internet and it could go to millions of people anywhere in the world? About 40% of the world right now has access to the internet and if Mr. Musk gets his way, everybody will. <laughs> so we are now ready to live this message. It is being longed for by people who left churches because they don't find anything in them that comes to the, that answers the needs that are in their hearts, placed there by God. Longings for being, why doesn't anybody want, what person would not want someone to accept them as they truly are if they tr want to be who they truly are? Does that make sense? This isn't magic stuff. I mean, a person needs to want to be who they are. But when I think of the damage, and I didn't go into this, but I think of the damage that happens to us when we come into the world and we're innocent and beautiful and I've never looked at a baby yet that I just didn't go, oh, you know, how incredibly beautiful. You know, and, uh, and yet we come into the world and then we get experience, first and foremost, our family. There is not a family in the world that I know of, not even the Holy Family. I would, well, I shouldn't say that, but because she got pretty upset with her son. Why did you do this to me? As Mary said, I said, it sounds like my mother. <laughs> Why'd you do it to me? 
I had to, he said. But that's not an abuse. But so many things that happen to us in family are not intended abuse, but abusive in the sense that the people we end up being our parents who are, I definitely believe, the parents we need to have, are going to work, are going to be the carrier of something that we have to work through, both for them and for the, the whole culture. Anybody that thinks I have the wrong parents is, ma is mistaken. Anybody that thinks that um, their brothers and sisters, if they didn't have those, they would be so much healthier. I don't think so. Everything that happens to us is for this purpose. So why would we start complaining about something that's difficult when the difficulty is something we are invited to work through with them and for them? It's how the world gets better and better. So, I have no idea what time it is. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh, I've overstayed my stay. Gosh. Um, wow, thank you so much. You're so wonderful to listen. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Will. Our next talk. You just heard about the first 35 minutes of our next talk on May 25th. Give a round of applause for Monsignor. You know, a couple of things just to, to kind of close out the day. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I could be wrong here, but I think that Monsignor has given two talks in the last five years. And what is wonderful about his energy, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the types of time, right? Kronos and Kairos. Kronos is man's time. He, he, he made reference to that earlier. Kairos is God's time. Um, I can't tell you how many times, sisters, I'm, what you've experienced most of your life, I'm sure, We've had these timeless conversations uh, with our staff um, and with this teaching that we're trying to share. I have a big prayer to ask for, and that is we are uh, tracking his wonder by trying to create a curriculum. And one of our board members, August Polizzi is in the back, um, was mentioning that these are the kind of talks that we're gonna be pulling, uh, pillars and things that really uh, stick to us. I know that I've been really moved, like I mentioned earlier, about St. Bonaventure and St. And, and Thomas Aquinas, but I've also been really moved, and here's a piece of context that you'll learn about in the curriculum. Um, Monsignor was in seminary from 1961 to 1967. The Vatican, the Second Vatican Council happened between 63 and 65, and it was in 1964 that an elder priest told him it would be about 50 years before some of these changes were coming to fruition. So imagine if you had all that information coming into a talk like this. Uh, so please say a prayer for us there. Uh, we're a small staff. Uh, we're working really hard uh, to, to catch up to this man who's very much like a comet, I would say. And uh, we have a ton of support uh, from our board. I know some of our board members who are here today. Thies Rice is our board chair. He's here today. Uh, Jake is in the back with some friends from Cleveland, it said that the folks from Cleveland had to come visit. Uh, Mr. Clark, John Clark is here, and then of course, our tallest board member, Mr. August Polizzi, is standing in the back. Um, but please uh, continue to support, look for the next talk, which will be happening on May the 25th, and then we already have them scheduled on September 7th and December 7th. Uh, we would love to see those of you who are gonna be able to sign up for Tuscany this year. Uh, we are also going to be, again, looking at doing some local Dallas retreats. By a show of hands, I try not, I'm going to try not to get in trouble here, but by a show of hands, who would enjoy a Friday night dinner experience and then a Saturday where you had the teachings on Saturday? Anybody? Would anybody? All right, good. We thought that would be a neat thing to do. So uh, <laughs> next time we might have three 40-minute segments uh, with Monsignor Fisher. Thank you so much. Can everybody give a round of applause to Julie Condi for putting everything together? To Delilah and Sienna Ritchie over there. We want to thank our video team, our audio team.
And in case you're wondering, the most unsung member of our team is Mr. Kyle Cross. He produces all of our homilies, our reflections. He'll be producing all of our podcasts. So thank you very much once again for being here. And uh, in closing, can I give you one gift that Monsignor wanted me to offer? And that are four phrases. If you'd like to write them down, you can. If not, um, I'll just say them for you. This is a prayer uh, that Monsignor says with us that works wonderfully as a meditation. We began the day with a poem called Teach Me. That's actually um, part of what's here. So there are four phrases, they're very short. Take me, teach me, hold me, and free me. It's that simple. So number one is take me, teach me, hold me, and free me. I know that's a powerful mantra in prayer for Monsignor. Um, if you can imagine yourself breathing in, take me, and then exhale. Breathe in, teach me, and exhale. Breathe in, hold me, and exhale. And breathe in, free me. Let's do that one more time. Teach me. Take me. Hold me. Free me. Last time. Take me. Teach me. Hold me. Free me. Be encouraged to add that to your morning prayer, evening prayer, five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you in May. God bless.